Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Hi, my name is Stan Pons, and I'm the host of Make It Clear and the president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Thanks for listening to the daily Bible teaching on Make It Clear. From time to time, I want to bring to you Bible teachers and friends from seasons of yesterday and today who had a great influence on my life, hoping they'll add value to yours as they did mine. Well, today, our guest Bible teacher is Ed Horde. Dr. Horde is a graduate of Florida Bible College and now the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Zebulon, Georgia. He is also a professor of biblical and theological studies at Grace Biblical Seminary. Ed and his wife, Gigi, have three grown sons and three grandchildren. Ed has had a love for radio that has spanned more than 50 years, and he holds the FCC Highest Broadcast Engineer's License, and he's the co-owner of WKEU in Griffin, Georgia. Well, here's my guest today, Dr. Ed Hoare. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. You'll find Isaiah in the Old Testament. And uh, chapter 9 is one of the major, major passages in the book of Isaiah. You all know the Word of God is so incredible. How how many books in the Bible? 66. How many chapters in Isaiah? 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. But did you know this? That Isaiah is divided into two major divisions. The first division is at chapter 39. So there are 39 chapters of Isaiah that have one theme, 27 chapters another theme, just like the New Testament and the Old Testament. 39 books of the Old, 27 books of the New. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to begin our reading in uh, verse 2 in a minute. Just keep your seats, but hold your Bibles up and let's do this together. This is my Bible. God's Holy Word. It contains all I need to know about God, myself, and others. In it are the truths about eternal life, abundant life, and my life. This is God's manual for living. If I obey it, I'll be happy, healthy, and holy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 2. This morning begins a new series of messages. I'm going to preach four in the series. This is my Christmas series of messages. Today is the first Sunday of what we call Advent. Anybody know what the word Advent means? It's a Latin word. Advent. Coming. Yeah, a coming too. Yeah. And so as we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world in Bethlehem as a human being, this is the first Sunday that we begin to celebrate that. So I always like to go back to the Old Testament and realize and help you realize along with me that Jesus Christ's coming has been predicted for a long, long time. Isaiah lived in the 8th century B.C. and he anticipated the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Isaiah 9-6 is all about. A few years ago, I read the true story of a New York City man who bought a newspaper from a a little boy at a newspaper stand. While the man was waiting for the boy to give him his change, he said to the young boy, what's your name? Little boy looked up at the man and said, Ronald Reagan. The man said, that's a pretty famous name, isn't it? Well, it ought to be, said the boy. I've been selling newspapers on this corner for about four months. <laughs> Names have always been important, have they not? In 1949, there was an important meeting held in the then Soviet Union at a place called Yalta. World War II had just ended, and the heads of government of the United States and the Soviet Union and uh, the United Kingdom had met for the purpose of discussing Germany and Europe's post-war reorganization. The three countries were represented by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, 
and Premier Joseph Stalin. Well, Mr. Roosevelt had a personal assistant whose name was Harry Hopkins. Hopkins saw this rare gathering of the three most important leaders in the world as an historic event, and he wanted to get the autographs of all three of the men. Well, they looked around to find some paper, couldn't find any paper. Finally, Mr. Stalin pulled out of his pocket a one-ruble note. Now, folks, in 1945, a one-ruble note was worth about eight U.S. dollars. But in 1987, that note was sold at auction with the three names of the most three most powerful people in the world at that time, and it sold for $42,000. It is the only known document that exists bearing the names of all three men who changed the course of world history. Names have always been important. They've always been valuable. But there is a name that is far more important, that is far more valuable than Roosevelt, Churchill, or Stalin. It is the name that has influenced human history more than any other single name, Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. The prophet Isaiah looked 700 years into the future and gave us four names that relate to the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus. G. Campbell Morgan, a great biblical commentator, said, These names constitute a progressive revelation of God. Jesus Christ is the ultimate and consummate revelation of God. And he has given numerous designations and names in the Bible that are descriptive of his person, of his character, and of his ministry. Isaiah's insight into the character of Christ as contained in these four names reveals the most sublime insight of all the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah's words and designations of the coming Messiah are contrasted against the backslidden background of the nation Israel. The nation has crumbled under the wicked and weak King Ahaz. The people longed for a leader who would lift Israel from its spiritual lethargy. Isaiah looked through his prophetic periscope into the fascinating future, and who did he see? He saw the Lord Jesus. What does the coming of Christ into the world mean to you this Christmas season? Is Christmas simply a part of your religion? Something you do on Sundays and at Christmas and Easter time? Or is it a season, is this season merely a part of your American cultural heritage? Is Christmas to you just about the music or the sentimentality of a sweet story about the birth of a baby? Well, it is that, but it is much, much more. Jesus declared, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But you may be sitting here this morning saying, well, I lost my job. I lost my job. What do the names of Jesus have to do with helping me through my crisis? Or my husband filed for a divorce. How can the names of Jesus help me? Or my son is in Afghanistan. How, how can this message help him? Or Christmas always seems to depress me. How can a man who lived centuries ago know how I feel? Well, these are good and honest questions. So let's try to answer them as we look at the four names that Isaiah reveals to us describing the nature, the ministry, and the will of God through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot is used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For 
Unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Woo! Man. Had to make a Presbyterian shout. <laughs> Folks, what is the names, those four names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, really mean to us today? Well, here we go. First of all, His name reveals to us His ministry. Wonderful Counselor. Have you discovered that there are two sure and fast ways to personal disaster? You ready? Here they are. Number one, Take nobody's advice. And number two, take everybody's advice. That's right. That's the sure way to personal disaster. Now, in the last 45 years of my ministry, people have often sought my advice. Here's what I say to them. My advice is free and it's worth every penny. All right? That, that's my standard reply when people ask for my advice. One famous Bible commentator translates Isaiah's phrase, wonderful counselor, as a wonder of a counselor. What a counselor he is. Church, I have sought and received advice many times in my life. Sometimes I get good advice. Sometimes I've been given bad advice. But God has never given me bad counsel or advice. And He never will. Early in my Christian ministry, I memorized Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own ways. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That's good counsel. What advice do you need today? God is the wonderful counselor. Trust Him. Let Him direct your paths. Not only does a good counselor give good advice, but He listens to us as a sympathetic therapist. In this regard, God is the great psychiatrist. One day a man said to his friend, I understand you've been going to a psychiatrist. Has he helped you any? The man said, oh boy, has he ever. He said, before I started going to him, he said, every time the phone rang, he said, I was deathly afraid to pick it up. He said, now, he said, I pick it up whether it rings or not. <laughs> When I first started out in the ministry, somebody recommended that I read a book that would help me in my counseling ministry. The book was written by a popular Atlanta pastor, a man named Dr. Charles Allen. Dr. Allen was for many years the pastor of the Grace United Methodist Church in Atlanta. And uh, the street that goes by the church is still named after him. It's uh, Charles Allen Boulevard. Dr. Allen's book was entitled God's Psychiatry. God's Psychiatry. In the book, he proclaimed that God is the great psychiatrist. He is a sympathetic therapist. The Apostle Peter told us, cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Many years ago, a man named William Cowper was in a deep depression. He planned to throw himself off the Tower Bridge in London. Mr. Cowper hailed a cab to take him to the bridge. But it was one of those typical London nights. It was so foggy that the cabbie couldn't find the bridge. So he took Cowper back home. William Cowper is the man who wrote these words. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But he is also the one who wrote, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. 
He wrote that shortly after his unsuccessful attempt to commit suicide. Folks, God is the wonderful counselor. God is the great psychiatrist. His name, Wonderful Counselor, reveals to us his ministry. But secondly, his name reflects to us his authority, mighty God. In the Hebrew, the designation mighty God is a military term. Isaiah told us that the government would be on his shoulders. Isaiah said, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over David's kingdom. Folks, one of the reasons why Jesus was rejected by his people at his first coming was that they were looking for this kind of Messiah. They were looking for a, a king, someone who would uh, help them to get out from under Rome's thumb and to protect Israel from invading armies. Well, they were half right. That Messiah is coming, but that coming is still in the future. Jesus' first coming was described, or rather, uh, yeah, first coming was described by Isaiah as well. It was described in Isaiah chapter 53 which says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord would lay on him the iniquities of us all. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him uh, stricken and smitten by God. And that's the, that's the suffering servant that Isaiah paints in chapter 53. But Isaiah also paints a picture of the coming Messiah in chapter 9. The mighty God, the, the mighty Lord Jesus who's going to come and rule and to reign. Um, uh, the first time he came as a suffering servant. But the next time he comes, he's going to be a conquering king. The first time he came to die. But the next time he comes, he's going to establish his kingdom and will rule and reign with righteousness. One theologian translated that term mighty God as God hero. God hero. Some years ago, I read a newspaper article about a young boy named Dwight Alexander. Little Dwight was a 12-year-old boy who was walking past one of those big green dumpsters outside an Atlanta Target store. He heard some noise from inside the dumpster, climbed up into that thing, and rescued a five-hour-old little baby that somebody had thrown into that dumpster as trash. The store's employees at that Target store in Atlanta decided they wanted to honor little Dwight Alexander with a hero's reception. So they got him a, a plaque for his community service. They took up a collection from the employees and bought him a radio-controlled little toy a car. They, they actually even arranged for a black limousine from the funeral home to go to his school and pick him up and take him to the reception that they had had planned for him. He was a hero. But ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years ago, a little baby was born in a setting not too different from a dumpster. Jesus was born in an animal stable and laid in a feeding trough. But this time, the baby didn't need to be rescued. He came to rescue you and me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This time, the baby is the hero. His name, Wonderful Counselor, reveals to us His ministry. His name, Mighty God, reflects to us His authority. And His name records for us His deity, Everlasting Father. Remember that Isaiah is using these designations for the coming Messiah. We know that His name was Jesus. In this designation, Mighty God, Isaiah is telling his 8th century B.C. audience that Messiah was going to be God himself. In another place, Isaiah tells his readers that Messiah would be called Emmanuel. That word translated means God with us. When the Apostle John began to write the account of the Lord Jesus' life and ministry, he began with these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Jesus is not only the baby of Bethlehem, he is the everlasting father. Adrian Rogers used to say, the day Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, he was as old as his father and older than his mother. He is the father of eternity, the everlasting father. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. But when the Greeks had spread their culture and language across the known world, there needed to be a Greek translation of the Old Testament. That Greek translation is called the Septuagint version of the Bible. And in the Septuagint, the phrase everlasting father is translated the father of the world to come. Most of us recognize the name Ryan O'Neill. O'Neill was a famous actor, one of the most popular actors in the 60s and 70s. Some of you ladies had a crush on him. According to an interview with his son, Griffin O'Neill, his dad turned him on to cocaine at the ripe old age of 13. Griffin said the only advice he ever got from his dad was, if it feels good, go ahead. Young Griffin said this philosophy caused him to have sex at age 11. What a great dad Ryan O'Neill must have been. But Isaiah calls the Lord Jesus everlasting father. He is the perfect parent. He never spoils us. He gives us what we need, not necessarily what we want. He disciplines us with perfect wisdom. His name, Wonderful Counselor, reveals His ministry. His name, Mighty God, reflects His authority. His name, Everlasting Father, records His deity. And His name relates His strategy, Prince of Peace. When I go to other countries, I at least try to be able to say, Hello, how are you? in that language. When I'm in Central America, um, I say, Hola, como estas? That's pretty close, isn't it, Joanne? (laughs) When Gigi and I were in Tahiti and Bora Bora, which are in French Polynesia, I said, Bonjour, como se va? Anybody know French? When uh, we were in Australia, I said, G'day, mate. (laughs) <laughs> that's hello in all those different languages <laughs> in a few weeks I'm going to be taking what probably is going to be my last trip to the Holy Land there are two main languages spoken in Israel Hebrew and Arabic the word for hello is the same in both languages in Hebrew shalom In Arabic, salam. And you know, they both mean what? Peace. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that in the region of the world where there has been no peace for 3,000 years, the standard greeting to one another is peace. I believe this is because they know that the only one who is capable of ever bringing peace The only one who is capable of bringing peace to the Arabs and the Israelis, the only one capable of bringing peace to this earth is the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is coming. The Bible speaks of three different kinds of peace. There is peace on earth. Isn't that what the Christmas angels announced to the shepherds who were watching their flocks by night on that Bethlehem hillside? Glory to God in the highest, they said, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Although the angels announced peace, it was not going to be realized in Jesus' first coming. Jesus' first coming was marked by strife and rejection and violence and death. But His second coming is going to be very different. In His first coming, Jesus was the Lamb of God. In His second coming, He will be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. As a Lamb, He died for the sins of the world. But as a Lion, He will rule and reign with righteousness. And there will be a period of peace on this earth for a thousand years. There's going to be peace on earth. 
at last. There is not only peace on earth, but there is peace with God. The Apostle Paul writes about this peace in Romans chapter 5 verse 1. He says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, this is the peace that comes at salvation. The word here is actually a military term. Remember that I opened the message with a reference to World War II when peace was obtained from from, uh, uh, Germany and the Japanese? Well, there was actually a, a snag at the end of the process involving Japan. Japan offered peace, but with a caveat. The Japanese emperor, Hirohito, was to remain emperor of Japan. But Mr. Churchill and Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Stalin were having none of that. And the Japanese finally relented, and there was peace. The Bible says that before you and I were saved, we were at enmity with God. This literally means that we were the enemy of God. It is our sin that separated us from a holy God. But when the Lord Jesus Christ made a complete payment for our sins on the cross, and when we by faith accepted that sin payment for us and placed our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the war was over. The war was over. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are children of God, and we have peace with God. And then there's another kind of peace. It is the peace of God. The peace of God. Philippians 4, 7 says, May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. A man went to visit the doctor. He was shown into an examining room. When the doctor walked in, the man was pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The doctor asked the man to sit down. The man said, Doctor, I can't sit down. I've got troubles at home. I've got troubles at work. I've got troubles in my marriage. I've got troubles everywhere. He said, I'm just plain run down. Doctor said, You aren't run down. He said, You're wound up. The man said, Well, then give me a tranquilizer. So the doctor wrote the man a prescription and handed it to him. The man took the prescription down to his pharmacy, John. Might have been you, I don't know. Handed it to the pharmacist. Pharmacist read the prescription and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't fill this. Man said, you can't fill it. He said, I'm sorry, I can't fill this prescription. What? What do I do then, said the man. Pharmacist said, well, here's what you need to do. Go home and get out your Bible because this prescription says take three doses of Colossians 3.15 every day for two weeks. Man said, well, what does Colossians 3.15 say? Pharmacist happened to have a Bible. That's why I thought it was you, John. Happened to have a Bible in his pharmacy. They turned to Colossians chapter 3.15 and read, let the peace of Christ dwell in in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. The pharmacist said to the man, Sir, your doctor says you need peace. And I can't give it to you. And I don't have any medicine that will give it to you. Only God can give you that kind of peace. Long before Jesus Christ ever took a breath as a human being, Isaiah described his life and his ministry with four designations. His name, Wonderful Counselor, reveals to us his ministry. His name, Mighty God, reflects to us his authority. His name, Everlasting Father, records for us his deity. And his name, Prince of Peace, relates his strategy for bringing peace into your life and into mine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. You've been listening to Make It Clear, and today's special guest has been Dr. Ed Hort. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church of Zebulon, Georgia. My name is Stan Pons, and I'm your host of Make It Clear and the president of Florida Bible College. If you'd like to know more about Florida Bible College and how it can help you learn the Bible and prepare you for ministry, then please visit our website at floridabiblecollege.com. That's floridabiblecollege.com. We're also grateful for all those who support Make It Clear. 
It is through your prayers and financial support that we have such a local and global impact with the truth of the gospel that so clearly states that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, because of the word of God alone. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and you want to be a part of helping us get this message out to others locally, nationally, and globally, you may send your gift to Make It Clear, Post Office Box 607901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Again, that's Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Or you can simply go to our website, MakeItClear.org. That's MakeItClear.org. And use the secure donate link. And you may also request your free devotional called The Word for You Today. Well, thanks for listening today and be back next time for Make It Clear. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.